All right, so for paper two, now you can start focusing on paper two. I'm working on building a spreadsheet that I'll put out there. I really prefer you build it yourself, but uh, there's a YouTube that shows you how to do it. The problem with the YouTube is that Bloomberg keeps changing their, uh, their system. I got Bed Bath & Beyond somewhat built. So it shows their earnings per share. They reported 28 cents. I mean, they reported four cents, right? We're gonna use the comp. The estimate was 52 cents, so they missed by 92%. And the stock did what? Fell pretty dramatically. That's a pretty big miss. What's the other thing you're interested in? How they did versus last year. How did they do versus last year? 50 cents to four cents. So some students talk about this, but in practice, you know, some students can help paragraph. Last year they reported 50, and what was expected last year was this. Guess who cares about what was expected last year? Absolutely nobody. All right. So you talk about three things, maybe four. You talk about what they reported, what was estimated, the prior, and there's maybe one more thing you'll talk about. What do you think that might be? Does this stand out at all to you? They reported 28, but the comparable is only four cents. So there's obviously something going on. There's obviously something in this reported number that beefed a number up that they considered temporary. I don't know who they are, but someone considered there's 24 cents in this number. So you might have to talk about that. That's not always the case. Look at the last quarter, wasn't a big deal. Some quarters is not a difference at all. So why do you want to talk about that? Because it's just, it just, Sticks out, right? What is it that they did that caused their earnings to be so much higher than what the market's focused in on? Uh, but even then, they still missed even on that number. All right. Then you look at revenues. I'll try to fix the revenues for you. Bloomberg actually put, brings it in with a B or an M from billions or millions. I took all those out. How did I do on revenue? Expected, usually the reported and comp will be the same on revenue, but I have seen differences, which to me seems really strange. I mean, what adjustments do you have for revenue that are temporary? But how did they do in revenues? They missed. Now, a miss on revenues is a much bigger deal than a miss on earnings. So a 10% miss on earnings isn't that big of a deal. A 3% miss on revenues is a big deal, all right? They should get much closer to revenues than they should because you know revenues shouldn't be all that radical. And how did they do versus last year? Now you might say COVID, right? But what's the re what's the problem with saying COVID? Didn't we have COVID last year too? And you see COVID in these numbers? Two seven, two seven. You don't really see COVID at all in their numbers. It doesn't look like they were impacted. It seems like it should have impacted them a lot. What do they sell that maybe people wanted to buy? They sell smelly hand stuff, right? So maybe that's the only thing I ever buy from Best Buy. A bad, 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 what is it? BBBY, I can never remember the name of the company. That's maybe why they're going out of business. Huh? Yeah, this, I, I forgot the name, what BBBY is, but um, I always say Best Buy because it's BBY. All right, and then the next thing you look at the gross margin, Bloomberg brings in percents as 9%. So when I convert this to basis points, why do I multiply by 100 and not 10,000? Because it's it's already multiplied by 100, all right? So how did I do on gross margin? They missed by 159 basis points, which is what, 1.59%. Is that a big miss? That's a pretty big miss. Gross margins should be almost one of the most predictable things you have. That's a huge miss. The last year they actually crushed on gross margin, their gross margins are down. Why would they be doing worse this year versus last year when we're in the middle of a pandemic last year? It just seems a little strange. And then the last thing we do is look at EBIT, the EBIT margin. This is EBIT here. So I calculate the EBIT margin over here. Their EBIT margin, EBIT, anytime you see the word margin, you divide it by revenue. So the EBIT margin is their EBIT dot divided by their revenue. They reported 4.26% and the estimate was 7. Point. What doesn't make sense here is that the reported and the comp are almost the same and yet the earnings per share is radically different. So I can't explain that why I hate this thing. It's always in the wrong spot. 
So I can explain that. That's one of the things, you know, one of those mysteries, if you get this company, this one of those mysteries, you got to try to figure out how can they be so close to earnings? Kind of implies what? What do you have left? Go E B I T D A. Do you think it's depreciation and amortization? They had some wild depreciation number they weren't expecting. What's the most likely thing? Taxes, yeah. Probably not interest, right? That's gonna be pretty predictable. So that, that probably that 24 cents, I'm just guessing that 24 cents was probably some tax adjustment that they had uh, because that would not affect this number, right? But that's part of the, that's how you know if you should be a finance major. Anytime I see something like that, I'm like, I can't sleep until I go figure it out. I gotta go look it up and see what, what's going on. Um, one thing you have to be careful of is when you read articles, this comp, there can be multiple of those because this is somebody's opinion on what the comparable is. So be careful in the articles, especially on earnings per share. You may find the article they, re they reported 20, that 28 should be right. That shouldn't change. They reported 28, but the comparable was six cents or three cents. And this is saying four cents. I use Bloomberg, so my source is the same for everybody, but there are different sources out there. So just be careful on that. So EBITDA margin, they missed by 332 basis points, but they're 2,600 basis points better than last year if I did it correctly. It doesn't look like I did. Yeah, I missed it by, by a mile there. So let's fix that. That's one thing I have to double check. So yeah, that makes more sense. Now you're seeing, um, definitely seeing the impact. So their earnings per share got clobbered but their revenues didn't, how in the world can that happen? Well, I guess their revenues did get clobbered, didn't it? There seems to be a quarter off, but you'll see some firms, their revenues were okay, but their earnings got clobbered because of all the extra costs they have for keeping their employees safe and the separating. And then, you know, you think about DoorDash and all that, DoorDash isn't free, right? If you're McDonald's and you're doing DoorDash, it's not like they're delivering your food for free, that's costing you something. So you have to think through that, but that's part of what you do as a finance person. It's this forensic finance that you're trying to figure out how could this be? All right. So I don't know which team's going to get this company. I can never remember the name of. So um, if you have a preference, I've only had one person give me a preference. And if no one else, you know, calls for that company, I'll, I'll give them that company or we'll have a vote or something or draw. They actually sent me two companies. So um all right, so I'll give you this data. One other thing I'll do is I'll bring in the stock chart, but you should be able to do that yourself anyway. Um, and then we'll have our one-on-one -on -one sessions. And that's when we'll get into things like, whom should we compare them against? So maybe their stock was down 20%, but what else would we look at? Who's their main competitor? Do they even have one? Maybe Ultra, Ultra is not really. So who just? That's more clothing, right? TJ Maxx. Yeah, it's like clothing and stuff. This one, BBBY, Bed Bath and Beyond. Okay, I'm thinking. What am I thinking? Then I'm okay. You're right, Brian. All right, so whoever it is, so maybe I don't know. Um, yeah, it's more of a well. I mean, it's Walmart, right? You can go to Walmart and buy everything there for like cheaper. So anyway, you have to figure that out. Also, the industry is this consumer discretionary. How did this consumer discretionary do that day? How did S&P do that day? How did they do? What day do we look at? It says September 30th. But what question you have to ask? Was it before open or after open? I mean, after close. So if it's before open, then you can compare September 29th to the 30th. If it's after close, you'll do the 30th to the 1st. So you got to figure that out. How can you tell that? Almost always the volume will tell you. <laughs> if they reported after close on the 30th, when will you see the big increase in volume? On October 1st, right? If they, all, they traded, if they reported before open, you'd see the volume on the 30th, right? That's the one thing that it doesn't always, I've seen some companies that have had a lot of noise, but it usually does. All right, sorry, I have no clue who this company is. I have shopped there before. I don't know what I bought there. So I'm getting them mixed up. So what would they, why wouldn't their revenues have dropped? And I guess their revenues really, you know, it's, I, I think this March 15th, that's when they reported. I can't believe this includes the entire month, month of April. So, I mean, that really looks like 
That really looks like March, April, May, doesn't it? At 1.3, you can really see that that drop quite dramatically. Um, they bounce back, but you look at 9.30 several years ago, there's still a billion below that, still a billion below that. So they definitely haven't, haven't recovered. All right, so I'll do the other companies. These are the ones we have. I've had someone ask about BlackRock and Goldman. So we'll see on those, CarMax, Delta, Paychex, anybody know, know Paychex? I think they're more business to business, but they might do some consumer stuff. Thor, y'all know Thor? Thor is an interesting company. Uh, I thought Thor is interesting because they sell RVs. And I thought, you know, given what's going on with bicycles, I'm kind of curious that COVID might have been a, a windfall for them. People are like, you know, if I can't go to work, I'll buy an RV and I'll just, you know, Wi-Fi from the RV. I don't know. We'll see. Do you all think Thor did great because of COVID? Be interesting. And then U.S. Bank Corp had a bad report. There were only two banks that were down last week with the earnings. It was U.S. Bank Corp and um, it was a Bank of America. There was one other that had a bad, bad report. Might have been Wells. Yeah, there was one. There was a couple of them that beat, but their stock was way down. So I was looking for those. So, all right. So we'll get into that. I'll I'll get all that data and get it out on Blackboard. All right. So what we want to do today is finish up the asset strategy execution, and then get into some number crunching here. Y'all want number crunching, right? There's been too much. Um, templates and write stuff out, which is the important stuff, but, but let's talk about it. All right, on, on buying stocks on margin and shorting stocks, I should have put this under shorting stocks, but on shorting stocks, I have this on the wrong way, but on shorting stocks, when you short a stock, you're selling something that you don't own. Now, how in the world can you do that? Well, what your broker does is it says, oh, you want to short Apple? Well, let's go look in our inventory. We're going to go find Apple. And they'll take Apple and they'll sell it from somebody else's account. That seems illegal, doesn't it? So Mary wants to short apples. So their broker, Schwab, takes Apple stock from Tom and sells Tom's stock for Mary. And Mary gets all the cash. Now, what does Tom say about this? He didn't say anything. Why, why doesn't he say anything? I don't know. He has no clue. <laughs> Right? He has no idea any of this is happening. He just now, if he wants to sell his stock tomorrow, what does he have? What does Mary have to do? She's got to send it back, or Schwab's got to go find another account. So, if you're going to be shorting stocks, it's really important which broker you pick because you want a broker that has a really, really good inventory. So, I always think if you're going to short stocks, boy, go with the big, the big companies like State Street and Northern Trust. Those have huge inventories. Um, I helped a man here locally. He wanted to short tips. And he shorted it, but he kept, kept getting called back uh, because they just didn't have much inventory and there's other people wanting to sell and it was just a hassle. There just wasn't enough out there. Shorting treasuries is pretty easy. So there's an entire industry called securities lending. And so firms like Vanguard and Fidelity, they actually like people sorting their stock because what they'll do is they'll provide their securities for the sorting. And here's the way it works. It's really Pretty interesting. So USA did this all the times. Uh, and we got nasty letters. I remember our, our gold fund guy, he got nasty letters saying, you shouldn't allow your stocks to be shorted because people are driving the stock prices down. And he's like, yeah, we're going to keep shorting stocks because it benefits our, our portfolio. So what we do is they take our stock and they give us cash. And they don't give us $1,000. They give us $1,020. We take that $1,020. We invest it. We now, when we return the cash, we got to pay them interest. But what happens is what we make when we invest is more than what we have to pay them back. So we make a spread. It's entirely a spread. And so you lend your securities. Um, and so a lot of firms, they intentionally lend their securities. They say, here, here's my securities. You take them. Usually if you're a small retailer, you're essentially when you're signing up, you're giving them authority probably to do that. It's buried in the footnote somewhere. But Vanguard's Fidelities, they just lend their securities. They make a small spread on that. Now, what's the risk there? If they take that collateral, they get cash collateral and they invest it to make a higher return where they got to pay back. If what they invest in goes insolvent, they lose. But there's been very, very, very few of those. 
most securities lending losses have been just really minor, but that's, that's it. You loan your securities, you get collateral, you invest the collateral, you got to pay back the collateral with interest, but what you pay back is less. It's a little bit of a spread. You can add five, 10 basis points to your annual return by doing this. So it benefits the investors. Um, it's an entire industry. I mean, y'all know Al Gore, right? Or he's before your time, but the vice president, uh, almost president, vice president, but he was on the board of one of these companies. The company we use for securities in the name, he was on their board. I don't think they ever did anything. I think they just bought his name. He's a smart guy, but I don't think securities lending is his forte. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, it's an interesting interesting world. <clears throat> you could make that your career. It doesn't sound like an exciting career, but there are people who do that. All right, expenses. <clears throat> If you're gonna invest, this has actually changed quite dramatically. There's expenses if you're a small investor and there's expenses when you're a big investor. If you're gonna do it yourself, you used to have an expense called a commission. A lot of commissions done lately have gone to zero. You should go back and look at commissions in the 60s and 70s. They were like 40, 50 bucks a trade. I mean, it's just amazing how cheap. And then Robin Hood comes along and says they're free. And is it really free? Well, they're making money on margin and those kind of things. So they're still charging you money. They're just not charging the commission. I use Swab. Swab doesn't charge me except for every once in a while, a couple of pennies on my option trades. But other than that, there's no cost at all. Completely, completely free. Um, so large investors do pay commissions. You know, I don't, well, I don't really know. I haven't been a large investor for some time. Um, but when I was at USA, the commissions we paid were fractions of what I was paying as a retail investor. So maybe those are going away as well. Where you get killed as a small investor is the bid ask spread. And you probably have seen the bid ask spread out there on the stock market. Sorry, I'm about to get rid of this thing. Let's go to Yahoo. Oh, that's not how you spell Yahoo, is it? Okay, good, good old UTSA. So let's look at, um, just look at, at Walmart, why not? So there's the bid, there's the ask. The bid is 81 cents, the ask is 55 cents. How do you know which one? Oh, I do, I always have waste management, yeah. It's because our computers at UTSA are slower than my computer at home was 20 years ago. All right, so the bid is 67 cents, the ask is 65 cents, so there's two cents. Who gets that two cents? The broker gets that two cents. Who pays it? You do. So how do you know which is the price you get if you buy and which is the price you get if you sell? It's pretty obvious, right? If you're buying, what are you going to pay? The bid. You're going to pay the higher price. If you're selling, what do you get? The ask. All right. So if you can't remember, it's just, you know, the higher price is the one you're going to pay. The lower price is what you receive. It's just the way it's set up. <laughs> um, so that's, that is a big cost. I always look at bid asks because it tells me something about liquidity and bid ask is kind of wide. I've seen that on some of the option trades I've done and that makes me really nervous that I'm really getting getting killed. So I won't do the trade, the bid ask is really, really wide. Um, on Walmart, you would expect the bid ask to be really narrow because it's a very, very, very liquid stock, but you're still gonna pay something. So that that's part of it. And that's on, that's on every single stock you buy. So the commission was, if you do a trade of a thousand stocks, you pay the commission once for all 1000 of those, but the bid ask, it's every single stock you gotta pay. So if you buy Walmart, you say, oh wait, I didn't mean that, I meant to buy waste management. And so you immediately sell it, you just lost two cents, just like that, just by doing the trade, forgetting even the commissions. Now they, that's the probably the biggest cost for small investors. And it's probably a lot worse than we're willing to admit because uh, I've talked to people in the business and they talk about how retail investors are really getting ripped off in this market. But if you're a large investor, your biggest cost is what we call market impact. Market impact is because you're a large trader, your trade moves the market. 
So you want to sell a million shares and you put the bid in, what happens to the stock price when you try to sell a million shares? It's going to drop. So you thought you're going to sell it for 50 bucks, but you put so much into the market, it drops the price. That's the market impact. For large investors, that's a huge deal, especially for smaller cap stocks because it's much more thinly traded. If you got a stock that its average volume is 500,000 shares a day and you want to sell 2 million shares, you're going to move that market. <laughs> So you got to look at the trade volume. Um, I've had a few market impact trades, but not many. USA is not that big, you know, $100 billion, this is not that much money. So it's it's rare that it, I would actually move the market. Uh -huh. So on those bid and ask where it shows the price and then it says time. The numbers. What are the yeah, that's just the the block trades. Yeah, I don't know exactly what it means with that because I never, I'm not a real good broker guy because my whole career we had a trade desk. So I'm not an expert on that, but you can look that up. But it has to do with you know the, the block trades you can do. All right, so market impact. Um, there were a few times where I had to worry about market impact. Uh, there were some trades I was making on our 401k plan where we're just, we were shifting half a billion dollars from one manager to another. Uh, and it can be really difficult. When you have those kind of trades, you usually use what's called a transition manager. This is another phrase. Y'all probably didn't know this existed, but transition managers. What their goal is, to, if you got a large block you got to trade, their goal is to get that done with as little market impact as possible. All right, I just a good friend of mine. I haven't heard from this guy in a while. I'm on his board for his, uh, his hedge fund and I have no idea what he's doing. I haven't heard from him in so long. Um, but he was a transition manager, interesting guy. He went to New York to be an actor and he failed to became a transition manager. So, you know, you can always fall back on transition management. He was the transition manager in the country. He's just extremely well known from that. Uh, anytime transition management magazine, and there's actually a such thing, he was, he was always had an article in there. Uh, he kept trying to convince me to use his firm. I never did. And the reason I didn't, I always use our custody, a custodial bank. The reason I never use them is he could never prove to me that he was better than anyone else. At the end of the process, the transistor manager comes back and says, look at all this money I saved you. But it's all theoretical and statistical. They can't actually prove that they sold this stock for 50. And if you hadn't used them, they would have only sold it for 49. There's purely theoretical. So it's kind of frustrating. Um, but small cap managers will often just close their fund down. Once they hit like a billion dollars, like we're taking no more money, which is a big deal, right? Because that's how they make their income is their assets times their, their uh, management fee. But they'll say, we're not taking any more money because we don't want to have that market impact. So this is huge for, for certain types of investors and certain types of funds. One thing I like to do is... Um, like with a Vanguard or a State Street that have a lot of index funds, what they'll do is they'll do just this, this kind of um, match trade where if Vanguard's selling a million shares and they're an index fund and I need to buy a million shares, I'll just say, okay, Vanguard, I'll tell you what, you give me a million shares and we'll just take whatever the closing price is. There's no commissions, there's no trading costs. That's a pretty cool thing to do, right? No market impact. So it's like our trade never happened. We just swap our shares and whatever the closing price is, that's what we get. That's a good way to do it. That's why having the big custodial banks can be an advantage because they do a lot of large um, trades related to their index funds. Um, but yeah, there's there's an in, there's two whole careers I just gave you right there, securities lending and transition management. Neither of them sound all that exciting to me though. So I don't know how I wanna do that, but those are those are out there. Um, on mutual funds, you've got management fees, you got front end and exit loans. We looked at these a few classes ago, right? So that portfolio fee, you want to always look at that. So Thanksgiving's coming up. So when, you, when your uncle or aunt says they're using the XYZ mutual fund, you should say, well, what's their management fee? And when they say, I don't know that you say, how can you buy a mutual fund and not know the management fee? So you can really ruin someone's wait until after the Cowboys lose and then start, you know, they're already in the file mood uh, and then start asking those kind of questions. But, uh, you know, 
prove that they're paying your, you know, if they're paying for your college that you're getting something out of it by irritating them at Thanksgiving. Um, but yeah, people buy mutual funds. I have no clue what they're getting, what they're paying. And you always, it's one of the first things you look at. What are they charging? them? <clears throat> and you would never buy if mutual fund has a front end load or exit load. Never. I can't think of any situation you would ever pay a 5% front end load. That just seems absolutely ridiculous. There's no evidence those funds do any better than any other fund, even if you added the exit or entry fee back in. Even before that huge fee, they still underperform. So it just doesn't make sense. Um, so beware of, buyer beware of fees if there's no evidence that charging more. So we have these star managers. We hired some of these star managers at USA and uh, one guy, boy, he was, uh, but this guy, boy, he, he thought he he uh, created a whole universe. Uh, he had some good years. He didn't do well after we hired him, which is you know, kind of our typical um, curse. But um, but he has a few good, good years. He's a star manager, so they just jacked up their fees. They're like, we're going to take advantage of these good years and get as much out of this guy as we possibly can. But was he good or lucky? Who knows? We don't know. So passive investing is almost always less expensive than active unless I saw BlackRock once. BlackRock had a passive fund and they were charging like 1%. It's like, and what is that? But there was some fund they didn't care about. And if someone was stupid enough to buy it, they sold it. And so, you know, that's pretty rare. Um, so there's, you know, this is this is a racket. I really think you, you should come come to terms with it. If you want to be an active investor, you have to come to terms with it. The data is overwhelming that active investing underperforms passive <laughs> investing consistently and by a large amount. It's one of the reasons I retired. It's just like, I just couldn't argue for what are they paying me for? You know, our customers are better off just going to Vanguard and buying a passive fund. What am I getting paid for? Um, so it just always bothered me. I could always I could always add value on risk management. That was always my thing, and I added a lot of value there. That was just the thing I was really good at. But when you get a mutual fund, no one cares about risk management. <laughs> All they care about is returns versus a benchmark. So I kind of lost my my edge. If you think you can beat markets, then you need to figure out how you're going to beat markets and how consistent it is. Or you just you're just it's just hope. Um, so, you know, you have to deal with this. This is to me the, the negative side of, um, of active management. <clears throat> I was listening to, uh, was it Dane Ramsey? Is he the big Google budget guy? Mm -hmm. And he's been pushing mutual funds. And boy, I don't trust that guy on mutual funds. I was reading a book about him and uh, Susie Orman. I, I think these guys are getting kickbacks. And I think the reason they're recommending funds is not based on the um, what they think is good, they're getting based on what 12B1 fees they're getting back. Um, I don't think Dave Ramsey should be recommending mutual funds. I don't think he has any experience or any knowledge of it. He's really good at budgeting. I agree. Don't take any debt. I don't agree with having envelopes of cash in your house, but I do, you know, avoid debt. You guys should be avoiding debt like the plague the next 20 years of your life. That is absolutely true. But the mutual funds he recommends, uh, my guess, if you went and looked at the mutual funds he recommends and how they perform after he recommends them, I would bet you anything they perform mediocre to poor just because that's the nature of these funds. But he doesn't have a lot of experience in that. I don't, his his education and background is really doesn't give him any, but we, we he's real confident sounding and he talks, he sounds like he knows what he's talking about. So people do what he says without any evidence that he, he has any, any skill there whatsoever. All right, so we're now a new, a whole new term topic. This is really, really critical. So you've got to really, really understand this. Um, how do you calculate a return of your investments? Probably 90% of retail investors have no idea what the return on their portfolio is. So what we got to do is we got to pick a period of time to do what we call the holding period return. The most common is monthly. That's just the norm, monthly returns. You can do weekly, but most do monthly. Uh, the nice thing about monthly is that there's 12 months in the year and it starts and starts, stops with 12 months. Weekly overlaps years. So it just, it's kind of nice to have a holding period, be consistent with the year. 
Uh, so monthly is the most common. There are, there are many that do daily returns and calculate them. I and mean, essentially that's what mutual funds do is they calculate re returns every single day. We're gonna use this formula to calculate the holding period return. So the, remember the holding period return is returned for that month. So if you're doing monthly, it's, you get, get each month's return. And then what we'll do is talk about how do you combine those monthly returns to look at an annual return or annualized return. So here's the formula we're gonna use, real straightforward, your ending market value minus your beginning market value plus accrued income, we'll have to talk about that, divided by beginning market value. All right, any market value minus beginning market value. So any market value would be September 30th. What was the price? What would be the beginning market value? If you're doing September's holding period of return, what would be your beginning market value? October 3rd. Huh? Would it be October 3rd? Well, go, go the other way. So, so the ending value is September 30th. So August 31st, right? So August 31st is your beginning value. It's not September 1st, it's August 31st. So August 31st is your beginning market value. September 30th is your ending market value. And then accrued income. We're not gonna do this with bonds. It gets really messy with bonds. You should do this in your accounting class. How you do the interest method. Have y'all done that yet? The interest method on accruing bond interest. Um, so bonds get a little messy, but we're not gonna do that. We will accrue income on stocks. All right, so what's, what income do stocks pay? Well, they pay dividends, but there's three dates on dividends. There's declaration date, there's X date, and there's payment date. We are going to use one of those three. We're going to use X dividend date, X date. X date is one. So if the X date is in August, let's say they declare in July, X date in August, and they pay in September, what month do you put the dividend in? In August, the date, the month that they do the X, that goes X. And in fact, the stock price will fall by the dividend amount on the X date. Not on the payment date, not on the declaration date, but on the X date. Why is, why is that? Well, if you own the stock on the X date, you will get the dividend. So if you own the stock today and they go X today and then you sell the stock tomorrow, you're still getting the dividend person who buys the stock tomorrow is not going to get the dividend. How do you get them to buy the stock from you tomorrow if you're going to get a dividend? They say, well, you know what, we'll buy the stock, but you're getting this dividend, so you pay us the difference. You know, you reduce your price by the dividend, and you'll get the dividend, and you'll be okay, all right? So you'll, you'll notice. I'm going to show you all a big example of that. Um, boy, I don't know what time it is. In this room. 35, all right. All right, so that's the key. Um, we'll work some examples. However, the CFA Institute, you cannot use this formula. The CFA Institute does a modified DEETS. A modified DEETS is a time-weighted return. So time-weighted versus dollar-weighted. Which should you use? Y'all know the difference in time-weighted and dollar-weighted? Y'all know IRR? Y'all study IRR, right? IRR is a discount rate that equates all your cash flows. Use that IRR, you know, everything lines up, your beginning balance run by the IRR will give you the ending balance. That's what a dollar weighted return is. And it's your actual return. It's very accurate. If I'm looking at how I actually did, I want a dollar weighted return, but the industry doesn't use dollar weighted return. They use time weighted return. Time weighted return says the investor is deciding when to invest. They may give us a million dollars in January, yeah, they may give us a million dollars in March, but we have no control over that. So we're gonna take the timing of the cash flow out so that we're, our return is not harmed by the timing of the cash flow. So the modified deets or time-weighted return is talking about how the manager did ignoring what the investor did timing. But what's the investor care about? They want that dollar-weighted return. They want to know their actual return. All right, so the industry uses what's called modified DEETS. You can actually look modified DEETS up. And Wikipedia does a good job on modified DEETS. If I can spell it. I'll just go Wikipedia. It's not radically different than our formula. So, um, 
They do B minus A, which is the ending market value minus the beginning market value. Then it looks like they're subtracting income, but they're not actually, what they're doing down here is they're adjusting everything for the timing. And they do it on a daily basis. So if you buy something on August 10th versus on August 30th, they're gonna adjust that timing. And that's what this formula does. If you wanna see this formula in practice, uh, I use this formula with this, our student portfolio and you can actually see the calculations in there. So if I get a dividend, the X states when I'm gonna, going to accrue the income. However, for the modified deeds, I have to actually know the exact date the dividend actually shows up and I gotta adjust for that. All right, so um, it's a little bit more complicated formula, but it is the formula that CFA Institute requires. I actually think there's a little bit of lack of ethics here because firms argue that, hey, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be dinged because our investors show up with a million dollars to invest and the next day the market falls 10%. I disagree with that. If you watch the advertisements from this industry, they encourage people to invest when things are high. And so they actually have some influence over the timing and cash flows. Their advertisements pull money in at the worst possible time. So I don't think we're completely clean hands on this, but that's the argument. We shouldn't have our performance harmed because you showed up on the worst possible day to invest your money. The IR will put that in exactly. If you come in with a million bucks and then the market crashes, your return is going to look much, much lower. All right, let's, let's try, we've got six minutes. So let's do one example. Since I've got good old Walmart here, let's look at Walmart. All right, there's a dividend on August 12th. They didn't pay this dividend on August 12th. They didn't announce on August 12th. What Yahoo Finance is showing you is the X date. All right, I don't know when they paid the dividend sometime in the future. So you would actually, if you're doing August return, you would accrue 55 cents for August. All right, now, did the stock price fall by the dividend? It went from a dollar, $150 to 149. It fell by more than 55 cents, but that's because there's a lot more stuff going on. All right, I'll have to, um, I used to have the chart. I'll, I'll find the chart and show it to you because um, the best example of this is uh, Choice Hotels. Choice Hotels thought Congress was going to change the tax law. And they said, you know what? Before the tax law is changed, let's pay a big dividend so our investors don't have higher tax next year. So they paid a massive dividend. A $40 stock paid a $10 dividend. We had choice in our portfolio and suddenly it looked like our stock price fell 25%. I was like, wow, what happened to Choice Hotel? But it didn't fall 25%. The stock price did fall 10 bucks, but we're gonna get the $10 back in the dividend. And Congress didn't change the tax law. So what did Choice Hotel do? They just caused their investors to have a huge tax consequence in that year. Um, so there is some noise. You can see a dividend been paid and the stock price will go up. It's just because they had more news that brought the stock price up that offset the dividend. So, all right. So what's my ending? Let's do August. What's my ending market value for August? Someone write this down, all right? So we can keep track of it. 148.10. That's the ending market value. What's my beginning market value? Use the second to last column. This one right here, right? 142.55, so July's number. What's this last column? That's the adjusted price. What the adjusted price is, is they adjust for that dividend. So if you use the adjusted price, you're actually getting a total return for the stock. They're, they're essentially taking a dividend and reinvesting it in the stock. So that's the reason the adjusted price is lower than the actual price because they're actually saying, hey, but they paid some dividends, all right? So, and then what's our accrued income? 55 cents. So let's try that. So any market value, what did we say there? 10. Any market value? 55. Okay. Income, 55 cents. So my holding period return. This is just the return just for August. Anybody remember the formula without looking it up? Any market value minus beginning 
plus income divided by what? Beginning. So they had a really good month there. Oops. What if someone forgot to put the, the income in there? They would have reduced the return from 428 to three something. So the income's important over time, right? So we're gonna practice this, but what we'll do next, next class, where it gets really exciting, we won't just do one month, we might do seven years of monthly returns. And then we can start doing things like annualized returns, geometric returns, arithmetic returns, standard deviation, beta. Once we get all those months, we can now start doing some pretty exciting stuff. All right, I'll see y'all next class. All right, let's start. <clears throat> um, so we had an exam on Tuesday. I'm almost done grading them. I probably won't done tomorrow. Um, I always get so depressed when I do exams. My first problem is I don't know why the whole class doesn't make a hundred. So that always bothers me. It's very barbell. There's some really good papers and there's some papers that didn't do well. I never understand it. If any of y'all want to sit down with me and walk me through if you didn't do well, the exam question was take what we did the last several weeks and don't summarize it, but put it into your own words. The exam questions should take five to 10 hours to prepare. So if you spent 10 hours and you get a 30%, you really should sit down with me and help me understand. I don't mean 10 hours of sitting there working on an exam while you're doing Facebook and Twitter and texts. I mean, 10 hours on the vital. Where did the 10 hours come from? Where if you're taking a three hour class, you should be spending six hours a week on that class outside of class. You finished paper one, so you had essentially 12 hours work on the exam. So you had plenty of time, so it wasn't a time issue. The only thing I said was um, don't copy and paste. So my recommendation is read each section of the notes, look at your notes, and then write it in your own words. So I, I grade one paper, they got a 20%. The next one got 100. The 20% had about a page. The 100% had like 18 pages. So there's a difference in <laughs> an effort there. I don't know how long the one page took, but I doubt it took five hours. But if they sit down with me and say, yes, but I was here all weekend. I was working on it. And that's the best I could come up with. I don't understand that. But the problem that person has is the person that made 100, right? What did they do differently? So some students are like, they're just going to kill me on the structure review, which is fine because I'm very, very confident in what I'm doing because I know this business. Uh, I got a text yesterday. I should read it to you. But um, <laughs> Professor, this is blank. I wrote a paper for my project manager job at USAA. My AVP and VB told me it was the best paper they've ever seen. I want to let you know because I didn't have all that experience writing papers until your classes. Um, they liked it so much. I'm now leading two teams of software engineers for updates on USA's website. And I've only been here six weeks. How important is writing? <laughs> it's pretty, pretty important, right? So that to me is the assignment. Take everything we've done. Don't summarize it. All of it. Everything's important, right? Why did we cover that's not important? Nothing, I wouldn't cover it. All right. And, you know, the average for this class is probably going to be about five points lower than the pre pandemic class. And the pre pandemic class had to do this exam closed book. And I'm grading it the exact same way. So, can anybody explain that to me? How can an open book with all the time you want be five points lower than a closed book with an, with an hour, 15 minute? So, I don't, I, I'm missing something. I was kind of expecting it because I can just tell students are not engaged this semester. That transition from pandemic back to on campus is some students, they just, it's just not working. There's some transitional problem. We should have helped y'all better with it. I don't understand it, but anyway. So there's some good papers, a bad paper. I get, you know, I just think everybody should make a hundred. It doesn't make sense to me why that's not the case. I'll, I'll never understand that. But anyway, so I'm always disappointed. So I could have 38, 100s and one 20%, I'd still be upset. I'm focused on y'all being successful. Students tend to be focused on grades and degrees, which is incredibly useless to you. <laughs> grades and degrees do nothing for you other than give you something to plug into on resume. It's what you know that counts. And what do you know? You know, it's a question I always ask. You've been here two years, ETSA, three years. Sit down and type everything you think you've learned in the last three years at ETSA. And if you're not going hundreds of pages, then what, what are we doing? You know, 
So it's just, it, to me, it just bothered me. It's like, we should just shut down colleges and be done with it. Uh, so anyway, so, you know, I forgive you for, you know, forgive me for being so focused on your success and not on your grades, but I do want y'all to be successful because I want you to say the radically change the world because it needs to be changed. All right. So last class, we started off with measuring return. Um, and we start off with this holding period return, which is ending market value minus beginning market value. So how much gain or loss you have on the actual security itself from the price standpoint, and then accrued income, which for stocks, which is all we're doing. With stocks, it's just any dividend that's going X, you add that into the denominator divided by beginning market value. So now gonna handle bonds are much trickier, much more difficult because of the accrual. You have to accrue the income, you know, based on how many months you held it and the next payment and all that. So you do that in your, your accounting class. So we're not going to do modified deeds, but if you want to see that, you know, catch me sometime and I'll show you that. So what we're going to do is actually calculate it. Now, I, I can do any company you want to do, but let's, let's find a company that probably is paying some dividends just to see. Uh, I think I'll do Choice Hotel just because I'm kind of curious to show y'all. Uh, it doesn't come up. Still doesn't come up. So um, let me do another company then. What, what's been interesting here recently? What's reported this week? Uh, well, we can do Zoom. Zoom's an interesting stock, right? So we're going to get historical data for Zoom. How much in dividends do you think Zoom pays? Not much, right? Fast growing company doesn't really make sense for them to pay dividends. So with their historical prices daily, we'll go back to the max, which might not be that far back because it's not that old of a company. And then we'll download that. Oh, sorry, I wanna do monthly, right? We need the holding period, so we're gonna do monthly. And download that. So now I've got monthly. Got monthly data back to 2019. So not a very old company. All right. So we don't have dividends anywhere near in here. This firm doesn't pay dividends. If the firm did pay dividends, you would notice it because the closing price and the adjusted close in the first period would be different. The adjusted close takes those dividends out so you can really see the returns. So for Zoom, we don't have to worry about that. So we're just going to get rid of everything. Well, I'll tell you what, just get in the habit of using adjusted close just in case. So any stock you do, just use the adjusted close. This works really well for stocks. So if you need a really true return on the stock, just use the adjusted close. It does not work for mutual funds, unfortunately. Yahoo Finance does not adjust for capital gain distributions. So when you pay a dividend, the stock price falls. When a mutual fund pays a capital gains distribution, the, the price falls, but they don't adjust for that. So you can't, you can't use this data for mutual funds, but you can use Bloomberg. Bloomberg has a really good total return application where they adjust for all of those things. Um, so in my risk management class, we use that process. We can really, really look at how, how managers have done. All right, so we wanna do a holding period return. So we could do a holding period return for the entire time. That'd be a little strange. So we want to break it up. So what period would you recommend that I use here? It's kind of obvious, but and what choices do I have? <laughs> yeah. I could do quarterly, I could do biannually, but we've got monthly data, so let's do monthly. So the holding period of return is going to be ending market value minus beginning market value plus accrued income. divided by beginning market value. In this case, in the adjusted close adjust for any dividends, we can ignore we can ignore the dividend, the income piece. We don't really need that, but on the exam you will. I'll show you, we'll actually look at some actual exam questions. Remember exam two is very different than exam one. Exam two is a lot of math problems. So some of y'all might find that a little easier to handle. All right, so we'll do any market value minus beginning market value plus accrued income divided by beginning market value 
that looks like a pretty decent return, right? This is pre-COVID. What do you think it did in COVID? And you can kind of see right there, right? And then right there, I mean, it's pretty ridiculous. You'll know how to copy down, right? You just double click this. When I see students do this, oh, it gives me kind of nightmares. I don't know what it is, but yeah, don't do not do that. Just double click. Pretty volatile stock, but we'll talk about that. So they had 39% month, a 32, a 41% month, 44, and now we got post COVID where it's starting to come back down to earth, but still well above where it was before, all right? So that's a holding period return. Our, it's a series of holding period returns. So each one of these is a holding period return for this month or this month or this month, okay? So now the question is, how do we do this over time? And that's when we start looking at averages, okay? and annualized averages. Most of us think in years. So if I can say, hey, this stock is up 43% over the last seven years, you're like 43% over seven years. Is that good or is that bad? If I say this stock is up on average 6% a year over the next seven years, that gives you something because the s and is up 10% and they're up six, that gives you something, right? We can think in annual terms. We know inflation is about 2% a year, you know, a good decent stock return might be seven, eight percent. So if we can put in annual terms, all right. So here's where we're going to learn some really, really important things here is how to annualize these. And there's two ways to annualize returns, arithmetic and geometric. All right, arithmetic and geometric. So arithmetic, you already know, arithmetic is just the average. If you have three numbers, you add them up, divide by three, that's your average. That's real simple, okay? Geometric, we're gonna actually link them together. So we're gonna assume we're investing and we make that money. So geometric is a little bit more complicated formula. On the exam, boy, I'm, the past exam, I was tempted to give them something much more uh, realistic, but if you're doing it by hand, I can only really give you three months. If we were doing it on the computer, I could say, go back and do this stock for the last 10 years, and then you could do it because it'd be really easy to do on a computer. So we'll see. Um, it'll be probably in class, so you'll only have three periods. So arithmetic, just take the average. Geometric, you link the averages. Does anybody know which of these will always be the lower number? Any guesses? Which is always lower, geometric or arithmetic? The geometric's always lower, and the difference is determined by what? You may know that. What will tell you what that difference is going to be? All right, so I'm kind of testing your stats. How long has it been since you've had statistics? You can see it right down here. The geometric will equal the arithmetic minus one half of what? Standard deviation. So the higher the standard deviation, the bigger the difference in the two of them. All right, I'll show you that mathematically. All right, so let's just do it. You can get a little bit of practice. So the arithmetic is really, really easy. It's not easy to spell. I'm not sure that's right. But how do you do that in Excel? It's just equal average, right? That's what an arithmetic is. It's just the average. And then you go up and you just take the average for all of those, and there it is, 6%. That sounds, oh, that's decent, except for what? This is what? This is monthly. <laughs> this is an annual. 6% monthly is really, really good. <laughs> How do we annualize arithmetic? Arithmetic, I, boy, I can't remember where the R's go. Real, real simple. Anybody know? How do you go from a monthly return to an annual return when you're doing arithmetic? What would be the most obvious thing to do? Multiply by 12, right? So that's, that's pretty straightforward. 72% sounds really, really good. What about the geometric?
Well, for the geometric, the way I do it, in Excel, as I start, and what the geometric says is, if you can spell it correctly, I should just call it geo arrow. But geometric says, let's start with $1. Let's assume you put $1 in this stock and you take that $1 and you make 11.36%. How do you get from $1 and increase it by 11.36%? You just multiply the $1 times one plus 11%, right? So what will you have at the end of June? Any guesses there? $1 and what? $1 and 11 cents, okay. What are you gonna have the next month, at the end of the next month? It's not gonna be a dollar or seven, is it? Because you can also make 7% on the 11%. So what's that gonna be, like a dollar 20 or so? So now you got a dollar 20. What happens the next month? You don't lose 4% on a dollar, you lose 4% on a dollar 20. And that's really key, all right? That's why geometric is so different. You can see it right there. The arithmetic is just taking average of all of them. It doesn't really care if you've made money or lost money, it's just taking the average. But the geo, if your loss happens after a big gain, you're losing more money, right? If you started with the 4%, you only lost four cents, but now you're gonna lose more than four cents because now you've $1.20, all right? So we have three months of losses there. What have we done? We went from $1.20 down to 88 cents. So we started with a dollar, now we just have 12 cents. What's the arithmetic average here? It's minus 2%. So we'll compare that to the geo and we'll see, you know, the geo is gonna be less than negative 2%, all right? So we can just keep bringing that down. Then you get these really great months. Now we're up a dollar to a dollar 83, but now we're gonna lose 7%, not on a dollar, but a 7% on dollar 83. So it's gonna drop pretty dramatically, but then we're back up again. Up to $3.18, that's pretty good, right? Because when did we start? We started in, in uh, May of 2019. One year later, we've tripled our money. How many of y'all done that other than you Bitcoin buyers have done that in the last few months? Pretty hard to do, right? What would you have done if you'd known this back here in May? Would you have bought the stock or would you have bought options on the stock? I would have bought options on the stock. <laughs> you buy the stock, you're up three times. You buy options on the stocks, you're up 5 million, 5 billion percent. All right, so we can just keep doing that all the way down. Anybody wanna guess what a dollar would be worth as of in the last month? $5, $4? You should kind of tell, right? We saw it was around $250, so 79 to 250. You can, you can do that math in your head, right? Let's go down and in. I'm going to take October out. So most of the gain came back, came in those first few months, right? How high did we get? $6. So there's your peak right there, November of last year. What do you wish you had done November of last year? You would have wished you had sold. How many people actually sold? Probably a lot of people were buying them, right? Buy high, sell low. All right. So what is your geometric return? Well, the geometric return is you take those linked returns and you raise it to the one divided by N minus one. Why minus one? Because we started with the dollar. So we take that out. So what does that mean we do? We take the 328. We have to figure out how many periods there are. So number of months so equal count so we got 28 months so we're going to take that equal the 328 link return raise it to the one divided by 28 minus one we get not six percent we get what a much much lower number what does that imply this must be a really volatile stock. All right, we'll test that formula and see if it actually you won't. That formula, if you take the arithmetic minus, minus half of the, the volatility, 
it works as long as the returns are normally distributed. If they're normal, the returns aren't normally distributed, and if it's skewed left or right, you can get a, a slightly different number. Now, how do we annualize this? Did y'all cover this in your uh, stats classes? How do you annualize the geometric return? Well, it's the same thing, except for we don't do one over n, we do 12 over n. Why do we do that? Because there's 12 months in a year. What if we had weekly data? What would I do? I'd do 52 over n, all right? If I had daily data, then it gets really complicated. How many days are there in a year where there's 365 or 366? But that's not the days we care about. We care about what days? When the market was open, that's more like 250. So daily, I hate doing daily because we don't know how to annualize it. We don't know how many days there are. So it gets a little tricky. Weeks can be a little tough because not every year has exactly 52 weeks, right? If you take 365 and it divided by seven, you get 52.1429. So even that doesn't help. So monthly is the safest. I don't know how many years we've had that didn't have 12 months, but it's pretty constant. So, so we can do the exact same thing again. We can take that 328 and raise it now to the 12 divided by 28 minus one. Now that number can be higher than the arithmetic. So when you annualize that rule about it's always lower, it doesn't apply. It only applies on the actual, the monthly one. Right. I'm going to calculate the standard deviation. Do y'all know that formula by heart? Your finance major, you should know, you should be able to do a standard deviation off the top of your head without even thinking about it. So, All right, so let me calculate that. 19%, that's a really, really high standard deviation. So if we go back to this formula, it's half of the volatility or half of the standard deviation squared. Okay, so let's try that and let's see if it actually works. So we take 6.5% minus the volatility squared. Whoa. And did we get 4.33%? We didn't. Why not? Well, because we know Zoom is skewed to the positive pretty significantly. So you could do a catharsis or whatever statistic you want to do on this. It doesn't work here. Other socks I'll show you will definitely work a lot better. But Zoom is a fairly unusual one. So um, it's very volatile, but it's volatile on the positive side. Its volatility is above the mean. so. This formula didn't quite work. So that just tells us this is a skewed population to the positive side. All right. So the arithmetic mean is 6%, annualized is 72. The geometric is 4, annualized is 66. How many months do we have? We have 28. The only thing you have to be aware of is on the annualize. The CFA on annualize, they don't allow you to annualize a data series if it's less than a year. So we're okay with Zoom because it was 28 months, but on the exam, I only give you three months. So on the exam, you have to put a footnote in. It says, okay, you asked me to annualize a number, but I only had three months, that's not allowed. And you have to put that, so. The CFA Institute, which is you know our rule body, does not allow annualized returns for periods less than. Which kind of makes sense, right? Because it's you know it's just not that much history, not much data, so you can get really really skewed.
So here's where you got quite a bit to work with. This can be in a stock. This could be on a mutual fund if you get the right data for the, the distributions. And why do you want to compare? You want to compare the return, but you also want to look at the risk. You want to look at some other things. If you take my risk management class, we have a paper where they do a full attribution, which is to me a really, really cool thing to do. And you're asking, okay, this manager beat the market, but boy, they did it with a lot of risk. So, you know, if I buy this manager, yeah, they, they've done well, but they've done well with a lot of risk, which means I may just be buying them after a particularly really good month. And then next month they could lose all of that really quickly. Or this manager's done, done well, they beat the market by a little bit, but their risk is really low. So, you know, actually I'm getting paid, paid and it's not, I'm not taking much risk to get that extra return, all right? So this is really, really important stuff. We calculate returns all the time. I have no earthly idea how many returns I've calculated in my career, but it's gotta be in the millions. Because you have these spreadsheets with thousands of things and you're calculating returns over and over again. So who knows how many returns I've done. All right, so there's the arithmetic, the geometric. Let me give you an example that so you can really, really understand the difference in these two. All right, so let's say you see your uncle at um, Thanksgiving and he says, oh, you took an investment class. Here's $500,000, go investment for me. So you invest $500,000 of your uncle's money. And you don't talk to him until next Thanksgiving or two Thanksgivings, right? He misses next year because he, he, he went to NASCAR or something. So, but, so year one, you make him 50%. In year two, you lose him 50%. So he started with 50, 500,000 bucks. How, do, how much does he have at the end of year one? $500,000 times one plus 50%. So he has 750,000 bucks. How much does he have at the end of the second year? $750,000 times one plus negative 50%. He's down to 375. And so now it's Thanksgiving and you tell your uncle, what's his arithmetic average? They, oh, sorry, uncle, we just made 0%, but you know, at least I didn't lose any money. He had an average return of 0% each year. What's your uncle saying to you? Okay, I gave you 500,000 bucks. I have 375,000 and you tell me you made a 0% return. Is he gonna buy that? He's not gonna buy that, all right? What is this geometric? So you take that and what do you do? You raise it to the what? How many periods do we have? Two, one divided by two minus one. Oops, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, we've got to do the $1, excuse me. I mean, we could take the 500,000 out, but I'm not going to do that. Ah, okay. Sorry. All right. There we go. All right. So we do that. Now we have a negative 5.59%. How do I know if that's right? I'll double check it. It looks low to me, so I'm gonna double check it. So if I take the 500,000, yeah, it looks way too low. So let's, oh, one over two. Okay, yeah, I was gonna say, man, that looks way too low. That makes more sense. All right, take that 500,000 and we make, we lose 13.4% in the first year and then lose it in the second year. Boy, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. That just doesn't make sense to me. That should have worked, but it's not working. All right. You should never do something in class that you don't prepare in advance. So there's obviously something right there. Ah, one plus. Why don't y'all correct me when I do this? All right, there we go. All right. So that 1340 means what? If he had made exactly negative 1340 every year, he would have the exact same return as 50 and 50. Y'all see that? That's what the geometric's telling you. All right, sorry about the math, I keep keying wrong things. 
Which of these returns is your uncle going to buy? The geometric. And which one's the real tree return? The geometric. And the geometric, you may have you may think of this as the IRR. It's kind of that internal return that equates what you started with with what you end up with. It is the true return. And it's lower, why? Because of volatility. And why is that? The 50% that he makes on the upside, he loses a lot more money on the downside because he's losing 50% of his original money plus the gain. So he ends up with much less money. So you can try telling your uncle, hey, we had an average return of 0%. Sorry, just didn't do very well. He's not gonna buy that. Say, hey, I lost you 13.4% each year. That is, that is gonna buy, that makes sense. That's about right. He's probably not too happy about that. Um, so why do we use arithmetic returns? Well. In my risk class, we do efficient frontiers. You have to have an average return in there. There you wanna use the arithmetic average. I had this debate at USAA. They were debating whether we use arithmetic or geometric and we're doing this stochastic model. They wanna put the return in and run all these simulations and they wanted me to put the geometric in there. And I told them, no, you have to put the arith in there. Why would you think I had to put the arithmetic in there if it's the higher number? If you run stochastic analysis, what's going to happen? Well, if I put the arithmetic in there and the model creates volatility, what I'm going to end up with at the end? I'm going to end up with the geometric, right? If it runs the arithmetic average with standard deviation, it's going to end up with the geometric at the end. So if I place, if you're doing a model where you're running simulations with volatility, you want to put the arithmetic average in there. Otherwise, you're understating your return. You put the geo in there and you run volatility against it, you're gonna get an even lower return. So I had that big debate with them. Um, so the arithmetic is actually the number you use for forecasting. If you're trying to forecast this portfolio for next year, your best forecast for next year is 0%. That's your best guess for this portfolio next year. Your arithmetic, so if your average is 8%, but your geometric average is 7%, and you wanna forecast this thing for next year, 8% is the better number to use. All right, that makes sense. I mean, it's kind of kind of tricky. So there is a, a role for arithmetic average when you're doing forecasting, especially stochastic forecasting, it's the better number to use. All right, but the geometric, y'all see how the geometric is whatever rate you need. So you take that beginning number and it equates you to the ending number. The arithmetic average will not do that. The arithmetic average will, will overweight. I mean, we can do the arithmetic average, right? But we just have 500,000 all the way down. There's no reason really to do that. Any questions on that? So know when to use one. So if you're looking at someone's portfolio historically, what are you most likely to use? You want to tell them how they've done in the past. What would you do? The geometric, that's going to be the best number. If you're going to forecast their future, you would use the arithmetic. Now, if you're linking in the future without any volatility, I'd use the geometric. But if you're linking in the future and you're not gonna have any volatility, I mean, if you are gonna have volatility, you're gonna actually run up and down scenarios, then the arithmetic makes more sense. All right, let's try another stock. Let's try one with dividends. IBM, let's take a really, really boring company. So we got arithmetic numbers. Let's do the max. This company has been around forever, 1962. Wow, it's, this company has more data than I've been alive. I don't know why it's showing me daily. There we go. Monthly. Well, it probably won't give me data back that far, but we'll try it. What does IBM do? They used to be a hardware company, right? But they're not a hardware company anymore. They're really more a consulting firm, I think, more than anything else. But they used to make PCs, which I don't think they do anymore. They used to make Excel, but they lost that battle. Um, so yeah, I'm not real sure. But what do you notice about? Uh, it, it switched it to monthly. Yeah, yeah, we won't definitely monthly or weekly, but monthly is the safest. Now, what do you notice about the close and the adjusted close? Huge difference, right? So IBM has definitely been paying some dividends uh, during this time. So let's. Let's get rid of everything but the adjusted close because we do want to adjust that for dividends. 
only goes back to 85, even though the data goes back to 1962. This is a something that Yahoo Finance has changed their site. So they're like not letting us get all the data that they have. I don't know why they decided to do that, but I'm not paying them any money. So I don't really have much control over that. I could complain, but you know, what are they gonna do? All right, so the holding period return, we'll do a monthly holding period return. So we'll do the ending market value minus the beginning market value, not really plus zero because the dividends are in there. That's just that Yahoo's done that for us. Divided by beginning market value. There's our first return and copy that down. They've had some good months. Their stock is up quite a bit, 138 bucks. You know, started back in 1985 at 13. So they've been up, probably not anywhere close to Facebook or Apple or, or Microsoft, but they are up. All right. So the arithmetic average is going to be the average. How do you get an average? You just would add all of these and divide by how many periods there are. Let's get the number of periods. So 440 months. Boy, that sounds like such a small number. I've only been alive for 400 and something months. I guess y'all have been alive for what, 200 months? That just doesn't sound like much, does it? What have y'all done the last 200 months? All right, there's arithmetic. Let's annualize that. Whoa, something's wrong. Oh, 440's in there. I'm sorry? Yeah. Thank you. So you just take the average of that. So that's 80 basis points a month. You annualize that. And you get 9.6. That sounds pretty decent, right? So how do we do the geometric? Anybody can tell me how to do the geometric? Can y'all walk me through it? Start with the dollar. Take your dollar, multiply it by one plus that. So we're down a little bit first month, down a little bit more the next month, down a little bit more. Finally have a good month where we're still in the loss. So 85 is not such a great month for I mean, year for them. The first year though, they did end up, so you did pretty well. You're up 18 cents. What's your return that first year? 18%, right? Very, very straightforward for one year. As we go further down, You can look at them in October 87. What happened October 87? That's, that's the day the market fell 23% in one day. That's a pretty scary day, right? So you lost everything. In two years, you had your dollar and you got up to $1.34 and now you're down to 98 cents, but then you slowly build back up. Not much, right? It's not doing all that great. They're still below a dollar, still below a dollar. Wow, you got down to 50 cents. Then they're starting to come back a little bit. Wow, you're up to 255. So pretty volatile, right? What's your ending number? $10. So you start off a dollar, now you have $10. That sounds impressive, except for it's over 440 months. So what do, what do we wanna do? We want to take it, the average and have no difference spelling any of these words, right? So the geometric average, what do we do? You take the ending number, because I started with a dollar, I can do the ending number. Now, if I started with $1,000, you'd have to take the ending number and take the $1,000 out. So um, divide by a thousand, but that's the reason I start with a dollar. Raise it to the one divided by what? 440 minus one, and it's gonna be going to be less than what? 964, so it's probably gonna be eight something. I'm sorry, we're going to be less than 80 basis points, excuse me. So it's 53 basis points. Let's test it and see. We'll probably get something much closer here. That's the one I want.
So there's the standard deviation. So let's try it. Y'all remember the formula? You take the arithmetic minus half the standard deviation squared. How close does that get us? I'm wondering on, um, boy, I'm making so many bad math mistakes. Why did, I for, why did I forget to do on Zoom? Yeah, the 0.5, so it wasn't as bad as I thought. So how close is that? That's a lot closer. It's still skewed positive. So yeah, so it actually, so sorry about that. You know, I do that on purpose to see if he's paying attention, so. All right, so that's pretty close, right? Why, did, why is the Aerith 80 and the geometrics 53? It would be because their standard deviation is 748. And that causes the be lower. Just the same thing we saw with the positive 50%, negative 50%. That negative 50% has a lot more impact on the returns. And so it's going to drag that geometric average down. And then you'll annualize it. So there, what do we do? We take the 10.06 and raise it to the what? 12 by 440 minus 1. you get 650, which uh, seems really low as well. Yeah, that's about right. It's a big difference between annualized Aerith and annualized geometric, but it can go, it is possible for this number to actually be higher depending on, um, on really how big the number is. So, all right. Very, very important for finance people because we're trying to look at things over time. We tend to look at history to try to get a lot of information. So you can't look at history without having some, some periods. So we, we go with these monthly time periods, or weekly, or daily, whatever we're looking at. But monthly is the most common. We have 10, 20 years of monthly data. We can do a lot of stuff with that. That's when you can do things like standard deviation and betas and geometric length returns and those kind of things. So there's a lot we can do with this data. You graph it. Oops. If you graph it, you'll probably be able to see. October 87 is probably not that hard to find here. Just a second. Okay, why, why can't we see October 87? Why could I do this graph so we could see October 87? Any suggestions? What, what one button should I, should I click here? What about that? Make it log normal. Uh, you still can't see 87 all, you know, 87, doesn't stick out as much here. Can you see 2008? There it is. Can you see COVID? So it's it's not, you know, doesn't look as extreme as I would have thought it was. But you see here, we're in the 90s. Boy, it's, you lost half your money. Then they came back and they've essentially been flat. They've been at the $10 for just forever and ever and ever. Um, but not an exciting firm. But the only thing they have going for them right now, I think, is Watson, right? AI, and I don't know what they're going to monetize that thing. And I don't even know what they're doing with that thing now. So it's it's a tough firm. It used to be the most important tech firm out there. When IBM reported, they were the, the blue chip bellwether stock for tech. And everybody was really excited. Now, almost no one cares. They're just not that big of a firm. I don't know what their market cap is. We should... We should look at that, be kind of curious to see. $115 billion, yeah, I mean, it's just, what is Facebook? It's several hundred billion and, you know, so they're dwarfed by companies that didn't exist uh, several years ago. So it's, it's, it's pretty amazing, but still an impressive firm for that long of a history to be around that long. I was listening to a podcast on uh, Deer 
I didn't realize Deere has been around for like 200 years, pretty amazing firm, um, but it's rare for firms to last that long, but their best years are definitely behind them. No question about that. All right, what I'll do next, next class, I wanna move into the measuring risk, but what I'll do next class is I'll hand out an actual example, example from the exam so you can practice on it and see if you can actually do the math. But yeah, this is really, really critically important stuff. You can see how important that holding period of return is because we can't do anything until we have that. So we've got to get that. Um, and it's not, um, you know, I got this modified these and how you calculate it. It's not quite as straightforward as I'm showing it here. Um, part of the problem is what actual price do you use? If you buy a stock during the day and you're trying to compare yourself to the market on modified these, you're trying to take that timing out of it. But if you bought the stock at 11 a.m. versus at 1 p.m., that could have a big difference. And so what actual price do you use? Use the closing price. If you bought it during the day, it doesn't make sense to use the average price for the day, to use the opening price. That can have a huge advantage. We had one portfolio manager, we we're calculating his return. And he discovered when the S&P was down a certain amount, if he did a trade like late in the day, he could prop up his returns on average like 1% a year. And so he's getting these huge bonuses because he's beating the market. And all he was doing was doing this trade with the formula. And we finally told him, we're changing your formula. And if you do that again, we're telling the CEOs. So he didn't do that again. But this is not quite so straightforward. It is really quite complex. There's a department of USA that did nothing but calculate the returns. Nobody wanted them. So they call me and say, Ron, will you take our department? Nobody wants us. I said, sure, come on over. Uh, so I learned a lot about calculating returns and it's, it's quite a cumbersome mathematical tricky thing. You know, you just assume a return is a return, but it's really not quite that simple. It's pretty simple if you don't do any trading. Right? If you buy something and hold it forever, that's pretty straightforward. But if you're making buys and sells, it actually is important when in the day you did the trade. And that can have a huge impact on these calculations of returns. So it's, it's pretty tricky stuff. Uh, there's departments that do this and no one appreciates them. They just assume these numbers are used. Uh, it's pretty obvious. You just pull the number, but there's actually quite a bit going on. All right, let's talk my favorite topic, risk. My favorite class to teach is risk management. So return, while it's a little tricky, we have a lot of confidence in the returns. Those, those noisy trades that we have that might affect us a little bit, then uh, that, that's okay. It's not gonna be that material, but risk is where we struggle the most. And there's four main ratios you use a lot in your finance classes, and we use them a lot in finance. Standard deviation, beta, correlation and R squared. And you should know these formulas and I don't mean plug them into a calculator. I mean, you should be able to write the formula down off the top of your head without even thinking about it. <clears throat> now, how many of y'all can do that? All four of these formulas, how many of y'all know it from memory? So just, and if it's not, I'm gonna try to help you get it there. So you should know all four of those because you use them so much. <clears throat> I think I got at least two promotions knowing these formulas. Because <laughs> uh, I remember one morning, the senior vice president who was, whose income was probably 10 times mine, he was in his office working all morning. I was like, what is he working on? I was like, the guy I worked with, what's he working on? I don't know, he's working on something. He was on his calculator. He finally came out and he said, I can't get this to work. And he was trying to calculate standard deviation on his calculator. So we plugged it into Excel and 10 seconds later, we told him, well, the problem is you're using a sample standard deviation and you should be using the population. So I'm thinking, you know, he should have come to me in the morning, pay me his salary for those six hours. And then we would have had the number. He knew, he, he knew standard deviation, he didn't know the formula. And so, you know, the sample, what's the difference between the sample and the population? It's your N, right? You divide by N minus one versus N. So that's important to know. We almost always in finance use the population standard deviation. Even though it's bad stats, that's just what we do. So, you know, your stats professor can say, oh, that's not true. If you're using 50 years, it doesn't really matter. Dividing by 50 or by 49, it's not gonna make that much of a difference. Um, all right, so these formulas, 
are very, very similar. So I'm going to see if y'all can permanently memorize these formulas now. And all four of them, the formula is almost identical for the four of them. So that's kind of the nice thing, right? It's not really memorizing four formulas. It's only memorizing really the differences in the formulas. So the first thing you do with all four of them is you take a difference. And the difference versus what? This is so key to finance. You're always going to subtract what? An average. And which average? Arithmetic or geometric? Arithmetic. Always arithmetic. They're right there. And that one thing right here, xi minus x bar, is almost the totality of finance. How do we define risk in finance? Is how far you can get away from the average. What's another word for average? The expected value, which is not really true, but so how, so the median, the average, how far can you get from that central number? If something's high risk, then you can get really far away from it. If something's low risk, you can, you can stay pretty, pretty close to it. All right, so all this is in the class notes, page 33. So all of them start with that. So with standard deviation, you only have one data series. With the others, you have two data series because you're comparing two things to each other. But in all of them, you take xi minus x bar. x bar is the average. With the others, you have xi and x bar and yi and y bar. But whatever you do, you start, you start with the average. That's how we define risk in terms of you know, the risk of the security and also in terms of the risk as far as diversification and correlation and those kind of things. The next thing you do is you multiply. With standard deviation, you multiply that one data by itself, which means you squared, right? So what happens with standard deviation when you square something? Where did all the negative numbers go when you square something? Disappear. There's no negative numbers. So that's really key for standard deviation. How does standard deviation de define risk in terms of how far you get from the average? Doesn't care if you're above the average or below the average. All it cares is how far you get. That's pretty immaterial. Is there an alternative to standard deviation? Yeah, there's something called semivariance. What does semivariance do? It looks at your standard deviation when you're below the average, not when you're above the average. So that's another calculation that you could do, but we don't usually use semivariances. If, if it's a normal distribution, it doesn't really matter, right? Because your volatility below the average will be the same as above the average. A standard deviation, we're gonna multiply those differences. So we'll always get a positive number. So we don't care if we're below average or below. What, what does your uncle care about? You tell your uncle, um, you're up 20%, you're down 20%, here's your standard deviation. Um, or maybe your uncle's up 20% You say, wow, that's a really risky portfolio. It's up 20%. And your uncle's like, what are you talking about? I just made 20%. But why are you telling your uncle that that portfolio is up 20% in one month is risky? In finance, what are we thinking? Well, if you could be that far above the average, you could be that far below the average. But your uncle doesn't think like that. How does your uncle define risk? Probably losing money, right? Because he's normal. He's not a finance person. Finance doesn't define risk as losing money. We define risk in how far you can get from the average, which is so bizarre. But it's because we think things that, could, that are way above their average could eventually go way below their average. And so we want to put that, we're so symmetrical in our thinking, we want to put that in there. So what's the other thing you'll notice with this? When you multiply these two numbers together, what happens if, if one of the data series is really far from the average? It's going to have an extremely huge impact, right? So how do we define that? Extremely sensitive to outliers. Standard deviation is extremely sensitive to outliers. I just showed you October 87. When October 87 happened, when people were calculating standard deviations, everybody was debating, do we throw October out or do we leave it in the data series? We throw October out, we'll reduce our standard deviation, but that may be more true going forward because we may never see another October 87. Or do we leave it in there because you know it could happen again? And why did they have that debate? Because October 87 was so huge, it was radically changing the standard deviation. All right, what do you do with correlation? With correlation, you multiply as well, except you're multiplying two different numbers. Now, this one's really critical because you're looking at like month one, then you do this for month two, then you do this for month three. If X is, um, 
is Apple and Y is Microsoft, then what happens if Apple, when it's, a, when it's above its average, Microsoft's also above its average. And when Apple's below its average, Microsoft's also below its average. What kind of number are you gonna get? A positive number or a negative number? And they're both above at the same time and both below at the same time, that multiplication is gonna give you what? A positive number, okay? What if when Apple's above its average, Microsoft's below, when after Apple's below its average, Microsoft's above, what kind of number will you get? You get a negative number. What are we looking at with correlation, R squared and beta? We're trying to see how they move relative to what? Not to each other, but relative to their averages to each other, right? So, you know, correlation and beta, it's not, do they move together or not move together? The question is when they're above their average, are they above their averages at the same time? Are they below their averages at the same time? Or is it different? That's the key to correlation. Um, all right, so first thing you do, take a difference. Second thing you do, you multiply. The third thing you do, you just take an average. And what are most multiplied differences are? That's pretty straightforward, right? So the average of the products for correlation, that average is called covariance. Y'all probably heard that term before. So covariance is that average of the differences multiplied. I don't know if there's a number for that for standard deviation. I guess that's variance. Um, all right, so multiply and then take an average. So the first three steps are practically identical for these two. These, these four ratios, it's only the last step where they're different, okay? For standard deviation, what do we do? We just take the square root. And that's why I use STDEVP. Why do I use the P? It's population. If I leave the P out, what will it give me? A slightly lower number because we're going to divide by N minus one. But I, we use STDEVP. Did y'all talk a lot in your stats class about sample standard deviations and all that? We tend to ignore that in finance. Why do we ignore it? Because our data is already so messy and so unreliable. You know, the stats people are precise and we're like, you know what? I'm using history and I don't know if history is gonna repeat itself, but it's all I got. You know, I'm not gonna go out seven decimal places when I'm not even sure if the numbers even mean anything. So why be so precise? So I think we're just sloppy because we know the data is pretty messy to start with. Um, and in correlation, what do you do with correlation? You take that covariance and divide it by the standard deviation of, of the first number and the standard deviation of the second number. In Excel, that's just called coral, C-O-R-R-E-L. How do you get R squared? Well, R is rho which is correlation. So what is R squared? It's just correlation squared. So that's really easy. So correlation, let's see if you remember your stats class. It can range from what to what? What's the lowest correlation can be? Negative, negative. negative one. Yeah, negative one to positive one. So what does it mean R squared can be? Zero to one. Y'all, Some of y'all talk about R squared on the first exam question, right? That's how that like parsimonious uh, if you can get a high R squared with 10 asset classes and just stop there, you've you're explained enough of that, that volatility. Beta also uses covariance. So you can see correlation R squared and beta are almost the exact same formula. What's the only difference? For beta, we don't use X times Y standard deviation. We only use Y with Y being the market. Why is that? Because beta only cares about the risk of the market. It doesn't care about the risk of the, the individual systematic risk, unsystematic risk of the stock. So beta is almost the same formula as correlation. It's just that we don't use the standard deviation of the individual security. We use the two of them together. And this function in, X, in um, Excel is just a slope function. There is an R squared function in Excel, but I never use it. I just do the correlation in square, but you can do an R squared function if you want to in Excel. So why should you know these formulas? Because we use these formulas all the time and there's a tremendous amount of theory in these formulas. How do we define risk? Why, why are we measuring with beta and correlation, all those kind of things? So, all right, we got enough time to do this. This is something I recommend you all do this at home. It won't hurt you. So 
So I'm going to bring in the SPY. You'll know what the SPY is. S&P 500, right? It could also be the market. So let's download that. Bring the SPY in here. Back to 1993. Adjust the close. And get rid of the first month, actually, because I don't know if that's a full month or not. Get rid of the last month because October is not over yet. It feels like it's over because there are so many Halloween decorations out in September. All right, so let's bring IBM 393. See if I can find 393. 393 right there. Looks good. All right, so there's SPX. M, I use SPX for the stock market. Now, is that correct? So the S&P 500 be our market. If you go back and read uh, William Sharp, he means every security in the entire world. But in the US and most people, when they're doing beta and those kind of things, they're always using the S&P 500. So it may not be theoretically correct, but it's the way we actually do it. So let me put that in there. And now we're going to do a holding period return for the S&P and for IBM. Y'all remember how to do that, right? The ending minus beginning, right about beginning. All right, and now I wanna do standard deviation. So this is what I recommend that you, you do. Well, I don't want to do it like that. So ignore what I just did. So let's do the standard deviation for SMP. So step one, anybody remember step one? XI minus X bar. So what do we need first? We need the average, right? So equal average. And again, it's the arithmetic of the S&P holding period of returns. There we have it. So what do we do in this first one? Someone just yell at the numbers. All right, I'll do the first one. Minus 210, minus 91. I'm going to lock that in. Everybody agree? What do I do with the next one? 0.7, minus 91. How, how many times did we do that? Thanks, Bill Gates. Why did he suddenly think I wanted 80 decimal places? How often do I do that? All the way down. All right. Step one, each return minus its average. We did that. What's step two? So you take a difference and you, you multiply. So what do we multiply? Someone throw that out. 301 times 301. I can't tell if y'all are with me or not, but hopefully. Copy that down. Oh, step three. Take the average of all of that, right? And then step four is what? Take the square root of that. How close do you think we're gonna get? I mean, I've already made several errors. Do you think we're right or not? Anybody willing to go a thousand bucks? So y'all don't have that kind of confidence, huh? Well, we did that, right? Because we did the average, didn't we? Did I forget that stuff? I think it's right, but who knows? I've been so wrong today. How close did we get? All right. I strongly believe you should be able to sit down and do that off top of your head without any, any help. All right. Let's do the same thing with um, IBM. Let's 
So we need we need the average. So there's the average, right? And so what do we do with IBM? You take the return minus the average. All right, does that look right? What do we do next? So take the difference, then you multiply. Take the difference, then multiply, then what do you do? Take the average. And then what's the last part? Square root. Y'all think that's right? Any when I want to bet a thousand dollars that it's right? I'm not paying anybody to do that, but would you in real life? How confident do you think? See me make an error? You think you got it right? It's pretty good. You should have gone for the thousand. All right. I'm teaching this fact exam review and Boy, there's things where it's like, I don't know how to do this in Excel because I do it every single step. I write out the entire formula because in my mind, I want to see the entire formula because I want to know what I'm actually doing. I don't like, I don't like using Excel formulas. I don't like the calculator. I've seen so many students plug stuff in calculators and get answers that cannot possibly be right. And they write it down on exams. It's like, there's no way that bond's worth $63. You know, it's somewhere between $900 and $1,100 and you got 63. Yeah, but my calculator said, yeah, but your calculator is wrong. And you should know it's wrong, but why did they do that? Because they're, they're not doing finance, they're doing, uh, you know, hitting keys on a calculator, which is not what you're getting paid for. All right, so that's it. So what about correlation? What do we do? So we need a difference. We got the difference already. We've already done that, right? We didn't do that again. What's the multiplication here? So we got the difference for S&P, we got the difference for IBM. So what do we do? Multiply those two differences, that times that. What, what are we gonna get there? Get a positive number, right? That's Bill Gates. What are you gonna get the next month? That's the difference. That's the difference. What do you get the next month? Another positive number. Another positive number. Another positive number. All right. So it's looking like they're somewhat correlated to each other, doesn't it? Ah, Bill Gates is of no value whatsoever to me. He tries, but he doesn't try well. All right. So there's my difference. There are some negative numbers. All right. So take a difference. Multiply those differences. Step three, take the averages of the difference. That's also known as what? Covariance, right? We could try that. Covariance of the S&P versus IBM. How close did we get? Looks pretty close, doesn't it? And then what's the last thing we do to get the correlation? You take covariance and divide by what? Standard deviation of S&P, standard deviation 0.6. That's a pretty low correlation, but this is correlation. We'll see, does that mean the beta is gonna be low? It's very, very possible the beta be really, really high. How high can beta be? So correlation can be negative one to one, beta can be what? Be 17 trillion. It's really easy to get a high, if you want a 17 trillion beta, then borrow a million dollars and take $1 of your money and put it in the call options on the S&P 500 and you'll get a 17 trillion beta, All right? So it's possible. Okay, so how do we actually get the correlation? 0.6, so let's see if Bill Gates can get the same number we get. He's probably right. So we do correlation of the returns. How close did we get? It's pretty close, all right? And what about R squared? So you can explain 36% of the volatility of IBM stock price 
by looking at the volatility of the market. All right. That's the R squared. What is that telling you? We're going to talk a little bit later about systematic and unsystematic risk. This R squared is a pretty important number. How much of the risk of IBM stock move is unsystematic IBM specific risk? And the answer is 64%. 64% of the risk of IBM stock is IBM specific. 36% of it is systematic and it's tied to the market. All right, y'all heard that term, systematic, unsystematic. So that's a pretty important number. What's the average on that? Well, it's about 20 to 30% is systematic, but it's not stable. Guess what happens to systematic risk during a market crisis like 2008? Shoots up, which is horrible. That What that means is, this is what I hate about finance risk measures, is we're talking about diversification, right? So. Just by putting IBM in a, in a portfolio with a bunch of other stocks, 64% of the risk of IBM just disappears. But that's in normal times. What happens in a crisis, that diversification benefit disappears and everything falls apart. So that's what I don't like about finance. And finance, our key risk protections work really, really well, unless you're in a crisis and then they don't work very well. It's kind of like having a, uh, you know, you buy a car and it has a, airbag and it says airbag will not deploy in an accident it's, you know warning so make sure you know it's like wait doesn't make sense to me all right so there's r squared what's the last thing we need beta we've already got everything we need for beta all right what do we do to get the beta the sum of the of the of the um where do we take the sum are the average, right? There's co that is covariance right there. No, that's correlation. Where's covariance? We, we lost our covariance, didn't we? Where did we put our covariance? There it is right there, sorry. There's our covariance. So what is beta? Beta is covariance divided by, remember on, on correlation, we divided by IBM standard deviation and the market standard deviation. For beta, what do we do? Only the market standard deviation. How do we go from a 0.6 correlation to 1.07 beta? So this is an above one beta stock. And it's because of that relationship between the risk of IBM and the risk of the market. Uh, let's see if that's right. What are we using Excel, the slope function? Could you bet a thousand on this one? You get a thousand if this comes out right. You lose a thousand if it's wrong. Let me see. Y'all are looking away. You don't want to admit that you don't trust your professor. So, uh oh. All right, I did something wrong here. What did I do wrong? Not this is not wrong. This is wrong. What did I do wrong? In a slope function, you have to do what? You got to put your company in first and then the market. All right. So you have to be real careful on the slope. On the slope, you always put the company first, then the market. If you don't do that, it's not going to know how to, you know, it's going to know which standard deviation to divide by. Uh, all right. Now, could y'all do this in Excel with a blank Excel spreadsheet with no instructions, not looking anything up? If you can't, then don't graduate until you can. Okay. This is so central to finance. This, we use this stuff so many, so much. Um, and not every finance major knows. I had a friend taking a graduate course and he had these finance majors and they were trying to calculate the standard deviation of April, 1993 for S&P 500. What's the standard deviation of one number? I don't think Bill Gates would even give you a number. We can try it, equal STDEVP, 2.7%. They're gonna give me a zero or an error message. They were trying to do the standard deviation every month. Did they understand standard deviation? No, it wasn't making sense to them. So, all right. So I highly recommend, you know, you've got the video now, you can watch yourself, but you should be able to do this stuff without any instruction. Just talk, you know, just pull in the data and do the analysis, all right? And then your mind knows what these numbers mean and it makes a big difference. All right, so we'll, we'll talk about how we actually use these numbers, but we're going to focus almost entirely on beta. In this class, almost entirely on beta. We're going to leave the others uh, out of the way. All right, we'll start there next time.